welcome everybody. Thank you so much. I, I know there's a lot of people who've taken part, probably people here have taken part in all four of our tour <laughs> retrospective programs. This is the fourth one. Uh, welcome to new people who have not taken part in the other ones. It's a pleasure to have you all here today. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Jeremy Dontremont. I am the U.S. Lighthouse Society historian, also producer and host of the Society's podcast, Lighthearted. And also with us today is the Society's Executive Director, Jeff Gales. Say hi to the people, Jeff. Hello. <laughs> You're supposed to say hi to the people. Hi to the people. Okay, thank you. Jeff will be helping with the Q&A after the presentation. Uh, and of course, Kip Sherwood, the masked man, <laughs> you can all see there, uh, will be doing the presentation in a few minutes. So again, this is our fourth tour retrospective event. Uh, this, of course, is an unusual year uh, with most tours and events being canceled or postponed. So it's a great thing to be able to share experiences this way. Uh, you know, I barely used technology like Zoom at, at all until the past two or three months. And now I'm using it all the time. It seems like a couple of times a week I'm doing something with Zoom. I think events like this uh, will continue to have uh, value after the pandemic is, is, I hope, well behind us. And this is a, a really good way to bring people together and share information. Uh, today's presenter, as I said, will be Skip Sherwood. He'll be giving us a look back at the 2018 tour in Brittany and the Channel Islands. I'm not going to say anything about the Brittany region of France in my introduction. I'm going to leave that for Skip, but you can all see that behind me is a very famous photo, let's see, <laughs> of uh, probably the most famous lighthouse in the Brittany region of France, La Jumont, uh, which is just about a thousand feet or so off the coast of the island of Ouchant. And pardon my bad French pronunciations, even though I have a French name. Uh, the granite tower, uh, La Jamont, is famous largely because of this very famous photo by Jean Guichard, which might be the best-selling photograph of a lighthouse ever taken. Uh, I was lucky enough to spend some time with Jean Guichard back in 2001, and maybe uh, later I can say a little bit more about that, but I know Skip is going to talk about this lighthouse and the photo in his presentation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the domestic and international tours that the U.S. Lighthouse Society offers are a big part of what make this, makes the society so special. The proceeds go to the society's mission of supporting lighthouse preservation and education. Another important point is that when you take a US LHS tour, you often get access to lighthouses that aren't otherwise open to the public. And finally, it's important to know that the tours are not just about lighthouses. They're designed to give you a better understanding of the culture and communities in which the lighthouses are located. There's a lot of lighthouses and a lot uh, more besides lighthouses on these tours, and you're going to hear about some of that today. Before I introduce Skip, uh, I have a request. I said it a couple of times already, but please keep yourselves muted at all times unless you have a question, <clears throat> and we call on you later during the Q&A period, and we uh, will explain how that works when we get to it. There's also a chat feature in Zoom. Uh, if you don't know, click on chat and you should see a chat box, and you can chat with each other during the program. You can choose to chat with a particular person or to everyone. Uh, you can ask questions with the chat, but save questions for Skip until the end of the program. And that's one way you can ask questions during the Q&A period. Jeff and I will monitor the chat uh, during the program. Um, and uh, also, I just posted, uh, before we started, I posted a Brittany map, the map that Skip's going to be showing in the presentation. I posted it in the chat room. So if anybody wants to download the map, you should see that. Uh, nod your heads yes if, you're see, if you see the, the Brit, it says BrittanyMap.jpg. If you see that in the chat room, give me, some, give me a thumbs up or, a nod, or nod your heads or give me some indication that you see it. I'm, people are shaking their heads. No, you're not seeing it. Let me let me try loading it again. Yeah. Make sure you uh, select a uh, whole group or whatever. Yeah, it's it's to everyone. But now I see it. Do you see it now? I see it. Yeah. Now you're seeing it. I'm not sure why you didn't see it before. Maybe it's because I loaded it before everybody came in. I'm not sure. But anyway, so it's there now. So if you want to download the map to your computer, you can do so. Uh, so go ahead. Somebody says still don't see it. 
other people are saying thanks. Uh, we'll make sure to email it to everybody too. Yeah, we will. We will email it to everybody after the event. Uh, as when Skip starts speaking, I'll also put a. I have it set up so I can post a link on the chat as well and can download it from the link. So I'll do that too. But we'll also email it to everybody afterwards. So so let me uh, let me get to the introduction of Skip and we'll turn it over to him. Uh, Skip Sherwood and his wife Mary Lee, who is hovering around there somewhere. <laughs> she she was there. She is. She's appearing and reappearing like a ghost. There, <laughs> there she is. She comes and goes there. Uh, Skip and his wife Mary Lee began volunteering for the U.S. Lighthouse Society in 2007 from their home in Fresno, California. In late 2008, they moved to Kingston, Washington, to work full time at the U.S. Lighthouse Society's new headquarters, the Point No Point Lighthouse. Over the next eight years, they became known as Team Sherwood as they developed and led 20 USLHS tours around the United States and the British Isles. Uh, Skip, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a retired logistics professor was in charge of creating the itineraries and dealing with the lighthouses, while Mary Lee, a retired grade school teacher, was responsible for accommodations and meals. She became well known as the doting tour mother and I can verify that Mary Lee and Skip do an amazing job at these tours because I did a 20 day tour in England and Scotland with them in the summer of 2017. It was one of the best experiences I have ever had easily. The last tour they did was the 2018 Brittany and Channel Island trip that you'll hear about today. Currently they continue to volunteer and are the driving force behind the society's very successful lighthouse passport stamp program. They now live in an active senior community in Bonnie Lake, Washington. I also want to mention that I interviewed Skip about the lighthouse passport program in one of the recent editions of the lighthearted podcast. Uh, I interviewed him about the lighthouse passport program. That was episode 56. Uh, if you want to look that up, it's easy to find on the USLHS website. So with that, I will turn things over to Skip Sherwood. Here you go, Skip. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Hang on a second. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I know. I choked. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do my screen share thing. Oh, where that's okay. It? Oh, here it well, is. You can, you, can, you can talk for a moment before you do screen share if you want to. It's up to you. Well, up to you. I just want to make sure it's working. There we go. Ah. All right. Well, welcome all. And uh, it was really good to see some of you I haven't seen in a long time. I got to thinking, you know, we ought to hold one of these things, one of these things with just for the people that uh, were on that tour. But I noticed a lot of you in the group are, were on this particular tour. Um, before I get started, uh, I want to give credit to Operation Europe. Mm -hmm which did the heavy lifting on this particular tour, and guy David Kershaw, who you see in this uh, uh, screen here talking to me and Mary Lee. Uh, fortunately, he spoke French. Uh, I spoke no French at all. Uh, Claire was on that trip with us. She spoke French, which is very helpful, but I don't think anybody else on that tour had any idea what anybody was talking about. So, and when we go through this uh, presentation, of course, one reason I didn't want to do this one is because, of course, all the lighthouses have French names. And I was, you know, embarrassed enough when we were there. It'll be even worse today. So at least give me a break on that. Uh, don't do too much laughing and uh, we can get started. Um, just to give you an idea, if you're not, when Jeff suggested this particular tour uh, back in 2017, he says, how about we go to Brittany? And I said, great. Where's Brittany? And uh, I really wasn't aware of the importance of this particular section of France. Uh, we had talked about going to the English Channel and the uh, Channel Islands before, but he said, well, let's go to Brittany. And so first thing I did was look up, you know, where it was and found out that it was settled way back in the fifth century by the Bretons who came from Britain. And that's why this particular area is sometimes is called Little Britain. Um, they speak not just French, but they also speak Breton. And while we were there, we saw a lot of signs that were in both languages. Uh, French is bad, but Breton, one of those Celtic languages, is even worse. 
um, those of us that were on the Isle of Man and Wales uh, tour, or when we went to, you know, Scotland, some of these other languages, uh, very difficult, but we did see a lot of these kind of signs. Um, the area of Brittany, you know, the regions of France that most people go to tend to be up in the Normandy area, uh, the wine country, Paris, and of course in the south along the Mediterranean, the French Riviera. And this particular area of Brittany right here is not one where you get a lot of American tourists. And, you know, I, all the time we were there, we didn't run into hardly any tourists from the United States. Uh, we did run into a lot of French and English uh, tourists because it's a very popular uh, destination for uh, the summer. Uh, to get a better idea of the area itself um, and why it was so such an important place for lighthouses, uh, first of all, you've got all these bodies of water, you know, around this peninsula, peninsula colliding, causing some extremely rough seas. In addition, that there's 1,800 miles of coastline in this one uh, region of France, which, and they got that much coastline, obviously, you're going to need lighthouses. It's got 800 islands, many of which are really small and just like big rocks. And part of the problem is the extreme tidal range, uh, where during the, you know, the, at low tide, you have rocks and shelves and reefs that are exposed, that are covered up at high tide, but they may only be a few feet under the water, which makes lighthouses even more important. And that's why we found so many lighthouses that were on rocks or very small islands. Uh, the only other place in the world, evidently, that has higher tidal ranges, one's in the Bay of Fundy, and the other one at the Severn Estuary between, uh, between Wales uh, and England, where we were a few years back when we went on the Wales tour. Uh, the land is relatively flat, and so much like the east coast of the United States, in order for these lighthouses to be seen, they have to be fairly tall. So kind of reminds you of being around like Barnegat and Cape May, uh, and that's one of the reasons why they're pretty tall. Plus, they're really landfall lighthouses as, as shipping comes in this channel here to get into England. All right, we started out in the city of Nantes, which is down here and actually is not in Brittany, but uh, it was the best place to fly into. Now, one of the things we ran into in setting this up was all these lighthouses are on islands. So we had to find 11 ferries to get us to islands. We had to go at a time of the year when the gates weren't closed. All that doesn't usually stop most of us. Um, Another problem was it was in July and Bastille Day, which of course is the equivalent of our 4th of July. And so uh, we were trying to avoid doing anything major on that particular day. But the real problem came because we had originally started this thing on July 7th. And then in the fall of 2017, they published the route for this. And what happened was if you look where Brittany is right here, the Tour de France was going to go right through Brittany when we were going to be there. And the main reason we found this out was we found out before they even announced the route because all the rooms in this area were booked up and we couldn't figure out why because they hadn't published the route. Well, some insiders over there ever let me knew about it. And so to avoid that problem, we changed the dates. Otherwise, it would have looked like this. Now, can you imagine our bus trying to make it through this kind of an outfit? And so we moved it ahead of uh, ahead a few days so that we didn't actually start until the 12th. And by then, they'd already gone through. Well, here's our map that uh, courtesy of Mary Borkowski and the, the, the patch that we used. Now, I want to point out that there are 69 lighthouses on this list. And as most of you know, it's been on a tour we often get what we call bonus lighthouses. And on this one, there are at least 10 or 12. You'd have to ask Darlene Chisholm how many there were, but you know, we're not gonna go through all these lighthouses. When Jeremy and I, when we were on that uh, Scotland trip uh, a few years back, decided that you know there was such thing as a proper lighthouse. And so we're gonna be showing you only perhaps proper lighthouses. Now we'll be cutting out the pieces of this map 
as we go along. Okay, we started out in the city of Nantes, and like every city in France, they have a castle uh, or some kind of a chateau. And while we were there, actually we toured, the, the, this, the group toured this at the end of the tour, but this was the castle of the Dukes of Brittany, which in the 13th to 15th century was actually inhabited by the Dukes and later on became sort of the, uh, the local residence of the French monarchy. Uh, there was the Cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul. I put these dates on here. This isn't, you know, in effect, you know, when it was built. It, it, it took this long to build it. It was like over 450 years to build it, which started actually all the way back in 1434. Uh, one of the fountains near the hotel was in front of what they call the Royal Palace, which was pretty well damaged during World War II and now has a pub in it, which kind of takes away from some of the historical significance of it. But one of the cool things that we did actually at the end of the tour uh, was, is this is an island near Nantes, it's called the, you know, it's called the, uh, um, the Machines of Nantes. And this is kind of like a, what they call a Leonardo da Vinci uh, type of, uh, uh, you know, amusement park, if you will. And this was one of the elephants that walked around, or you could ride on this merry-go-round, but the lines were so long, you know, we just sort of gave up. But if you ever get there, that'd be something you'd want to look into. All right, let's get to the lighthouses. We started out the first day by going on a ferry ride to Il Dieu, which is this very cute little uh, place down here, off the, off the coast down here that we came out of to see this particular lighthouse which actually was built only in 1950 because the original lighthouse was destroyed in, in World War II. Um, it's got a real art deco design. As we go through these, you'll see these little numbers on every lighthouse that we actually climbed. And this is the number of steps that's on in each one of these lighthouses. So you wanna keep total at the end, you'll see how many we ended up climbing uh, during that, during this whole tour. Um, the, uh, that's what that means up there. The original lighthouse looked like this, but when we were there, as I say, it had this much more Art Deco uh, type of design. Um, it was back, originally built in, in uh, 1830, um, but again, destroyed by the Germans in, in World War uh, II. We also got our, on this island, we got our first look at the impact of a tidal range. And uh, we were at a, we went down here to see a lighthouse. This is all we saw. Actually, it was some kind of a tower, evidently, at one time they built a fire on, because this was the other port on this island. But it gave us a pretty good idea of what we might run into. And one of the things you had to be careful of is when you went on the ferry, that you made sure you got off the island, for example, before this kind of thing happened and you'd end up having to spend, you know, the whole night there. I did see one thing on this island I thought was interesting. You know, baguettes are very common in France. Well, this was a vending machine that dispensed baguettes. And for one point, I think it was a little over one euro, you know, you put it in and a fresh baguette came up. I was not sure how fresh they would be, but you know how that is, but never seen a baguette machine before. All right, then after we were there, we went to the city of Saint-Nazaire, which uh, was really where we first encountered something pretty interesting. Saint-Nazaire is, on the, is at, the, uh, at the entrance to the Loire River and one of the major shipbuilding places in the world. And here we saw them building the Celebrity Edge cruise ship while we were there. Uh, it was launched some months later and now it looks like this. Another thing we were observed there because again of the importance of that as a port, during World War II, the Germans built this submarine base right in the city. And we saw, we did not tour this, but saw it as part of, uh, across from where one of the places we were staying, a submarine base with all its pens down here. It survived the war pretty well because uh, evidently was built very strongly and that, you know, the Allies bombed the hell out of it, but evidently never did any good. The next day, we went down to this 
lighthouse down here at uh, San Yildas, which actually is a lighthouse and a semaphore. Now, if you look at our number up here, this thing had all the 36 steps, but we didn't go here because of the lighthouse. In the early 1800s, the French built a system of semaphores that allowed them to transmit information from the coast, you know, talking, you know, looking for enemy ships and whatever, all the way back to Paris, for example, in a matter of hours. Uh, this was, of course, before telegraphs and all that. So what they designed was these, these stations, which, as a matter of fact, there were 534 of them spread six miles apart, a lot of them along the coast, where they were able to manipulate these, these arms in such a way, and most of us know what a semaphore is, and each one, each one would come out as a different message being passed on down. So guys in one of them, he's looking through his telescope, he sees this, he passes it to the next one, passes it to the next one. And they said that you could go from where we were here all the way back to Paris in about three hours, which was uh, about 370 miles. So again, really interesting as to how they use this. It was only in place for about 25 years until the telegraph was invented, but it was very uh, helpful evidently to Napoleon. The other thing, the, the first time we hit a gift shop was at this place. And you know how that happens. What happens at one of those when we have our people hit a gift shop? And unfortunately, this poor lady over here just was not ready for us. And we just overran the place. And it was, and of course, it always ends up with big delays as I'm yelling at people to get back on the bus and nobody pays attention. But again, it was, you know, uh, the first, the first and get, last gift shops are always the ones where people unload the most money, and uh, this lady here did more, 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 sold more stuff during this time, I'm sure, than she did the whole year. Um, after we were in uh, Sinazir, we went to Ven, and from Ven we went, took a ferry out to Belleville, and here was a, you know, that ferry, one of those large ferries that she ended up taking and again these little ports were so beautiful, very iconic, kind of what you would expect along the French coast. Here we're entering the particular port with the two uh, pure lighthouses out here. And then this was the lighthouse that was there, uh, you know, supposedly the, the you know, the Grand Fer de Belle Isle, uh, that just means the large lighthouse. Um, this one is, has a, this circular base, uh, was 243 steps tall, one of the most powerful lighthouses with a first order lens, uh, claiming that we had a range of over 30 miles. One of the stories they told us uh, was that at the end of World War II, uh, when the Germans uh, left, they put uh, a whole bunch of uh, explosives in this to blow it up. It did not blow it up, but they were discovered and so what they did is they found some German prisoners of war and made them go inside it and clear out the, the explosives. So that, that was a pretty creative way to get the stuff uh, out of there. Uh, on this, this is what it looked like from that fire up of uh, 170 feet up in the air. I really don't know who that is down there, but that was one of our people in our coach. Uh, again, on the same island, we saw another example of a port where, uh, you know, all the boats in the mud waiting for the tide to rise. Um, and again, if I remember right, we had a nice little lunch down on one of these, uh, at one of these restaurants here. Also on this island was something, was a series of rocks called the Needles of Fort Cotton, which um, were made famous in paintings by Claude Monet. But before I get to that, they pointed out to us here that, okay, this is a chicken right here. This is Louis the 14th. And over here is a lion. And then there were some other ones in here that when we were looking at them, they sort of made sense, but you know, not really. And when we didn't write it all down. So when I left, I, you know, all I could remember was these three, but here's the actual painting that Monet did uh, in 1886 when he spent you know, some months out there, and he actually painted six paintings of this particular series of rocks. 
and they were called, uh, the area was called Poor Cotton because when the waves crashed around here, it built some foam around them, making, look, making them look like there was, uh, you know, cotton wool. Another thing we saw lots and lots of on um, this trip was hydrangeas. And so almost everywhere we went, you know, there was tons of hydrangeas. Gives you an idea, you know, that the area gets its share of, of rain. From Belle Isle, we went to Lorient. And this was interesting because when we arrived in the city, this is what we ran into. This was the 15th of July. And when we tried to get in the hotel, uh, our Francois, our bus driver, you know, had to really fight with the police to let us in. But what had happened is this is the day that France won the World Cup. And we just so happened to be there on that day. And much like at a city, you know, in the United States, when they win the Super Bowl or something, they partied all night. And I mean all night. And we really didn't get much sleep that night because the bars were going. And I remember waking up in the morning finally. And of course, this is what it looked like in the morning. And all these people had gone to bed, of course. And by then, and we were just trying to get up. And the poor guys with their blowers out there trying to clean the place up. Um, it was an experience, you know, just, just because. And, you know, everybody was friendly. I mean, they didn't burn anything down like they do around here. But they, they were just having a hell of a good time. And I remember our bus driver was very excited while he was driving the coach. You know, we were hoping we would get there before the thing was over, but we got there right after it was over. All right, so after that experience, we went down to a place called Point de Penmar, which actually has a couple of lighthouses. And if I go back to this one right here, this lighthouse here actually was the uh, lighthouse that uh, brought people and pointed your way into the Bay of Biscay down here coming around this corner uh, to Lorient. Uh, there were actually two lighthouses here. Uh, this one down here, which was the original one, uh, which ha doesn't have a lantern room now. That one was built in the, in the eight, around 1835. It was, uh, there was actually a, an abbey down here, a, a, a chapel that was uh, actually dis dis displayed a fire way back in as early as the 15th century, again, because of its location. When they, when they went to modernize the lighthouses, they wanted to raise this one, but they found out that they couldn't put much more weight on it. So then they built the second one right here. Uh, this is what it actually looks like from the tower. Here's that that old abbey down here, or chapel, and in front of it was this. Uh, this is a, a, a French Navy uh, signal tower, and again, a better view of that particular uh, medieval chapel. Uh, there's the lighthouse itself uh, with a very interesting stone uh, gallery at top. Again, this one wasn't built until almost 1900 and uh, does have 290 steps going up. And this is kind of what it looked like. It has these opaline tiles. A lot of the French lighthouses had these tiles and most of them had these stone steps. From, from there, we went to Kemper and then to a trip out to Ile de Saint, which was uh, one of, I thought, one of, one of our more high, one of our highlights. Again, here's our ferry out there, again, into one of these really cute little uh, harbors. The original lighthouse here was built in 1839, but it also was destroyed in 1944, and they built the new one in 1952, and this is what it looks like. Um, we found interesting that, and I hadn't really seen this much in, in other countries, where the name of the lighthouse was actually uh, uh, painted on the side of the lighthouse. Uh, I'm sure that, I don't know that that, you know, that's some kind of a day mark. I can't imagine you can see that from, from too far away. Um, and 
the the second lighthouse, like I said, was wasn't wasn't built till after World War II uh, in 1952. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting about this island was it was well known for an, in World War II when Charles de Gaulle put out the call for the men of France to join the free forces, every male on this island between the ages of 14 and 54 got into fishing boats and went off to Britain where they joined those three French forces. And for that reason, de Gaulle uh, gave them the, what was called the Order of Liberation, which was given to very few uh, people during World War II. Um, and, and again, you know, that was virtually every able-bodied man on the island uh, going off to fight the war. Here are a couple of rock formations we found pretty interesting. Uh, never seen one quite as good as this, as look of the face or this one down here, but very interesting. And from the top of the tower, this was one you had to do a bit of a hike to get out there because the harbor's back here. And so not very few of these islands had any kind of transportation. And so we would have to just hoof it out there. Uh, at the other side of the island where we caught a ferry to get back was another lighthouse with an interesting outside access uh, like this called Mendrial, um, which was really the only two lights on this particular island. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out here is there's a set of lighthouses here that Ile de Saint is out here. And this area right here is referred to as the Rod de Saint. And in the United States, we call it a race, which you know is just an area where the waters are so turbulent that it's very difficult and because of all the rock formations to navigate through here. But the problem in this area is, is that there's this huge uh, set of rocks and reefs that go out about 30 miles beyond this island here. So coming around this corner, if you didn't go through here, you'd have to travel all the way out and around and come back. So they set up this system here. And of course, this is the lighthouse we just looked at. But then we also, there are other four other lighthouses that were built here. One right on the point here. Uh, this one here, uh, what was called La Vie. Another one here called Tivenik. And I think this one was La Pleu. And anyway, they made kind of a, a, a navigation system to go around here. The day we went out here was really the day after we were here. So we could actually see the Ile de Saint out here from that point. And this is what it looked like from here with the uh, La Vie here, the uh, lighthouse here, and that Chivanek was over in here somewhere. But you can even see on an extremely calm day, you can see how the waves here and at low tide, a lot of this uh, evidently is, is exposed. One of the things when we were setting up the tour, I ran into this, this thing that said, oh, you really need to go to Locrana, which uh, evidently was, put, it was, it was billed as one of the 15 most beautiful and charming small towns in France. And we thought, well, hell, this has got to be great. You know, we can go in, we can, you know, all sit here like at this little outdoor cafe and have a, have a wine or a coffee. And when we got there, this is what it looked like. What, they were having some kind of a, a, a flea market while you know, on that particular day, I can't remember, this must have been, this could have been a Saturday or a Sunday, and it was just a zoo. Um, so we didn't really get to see as much of it, you know, this beautiful church and, and whatever, but, you know, nobody, we looked at all the stuff they were selling, and it was like a garage sale, you know, it was stuff that nobody wanted, and we really didn't find anything there. But that is one of the most charming small towns in France if you want to believe that, you know. So this is why you got to be careful about what you read on the internet, you know. 
Yeah, I had a good ice cream here, Lisa. Uh, the next day we went to St. Matthew, uh, which was again one of these places where there were several different structures. The lighthouse itself, this is actually a little lighthouse. And if I go, um, trying to remember, give me a second here. Let me go back one. Oh, yeah, this lighthouse here, you can see where it's located. Going into the city of Brest in this whole area here, it marked that, that turning point. And that's, in effect, you know, what it was doing there. And then this little light here was actually used to help people find their way around the point. This one being more, you know, of a landfall so you could see it from a distance. Again, there was a, an old abbey here from the 13th century, which, again, originally displayed fires to, uh, to, uh, uh, for navigation. And here's that, that abbey again, what was left of it, another Navy signal tower up here. And the lighthouse here, this is actually a photo we took, was either the next day or the day after, because we, we, we took a ferry out to uh, Wisson and uh, passed this same lighthouse on the way. So it gave us a chance to see all these things again from a different angle. Um, here we are at the, uh, at the, uh, at the lighthouse. And this is where we chose to take our, our uh, group photo. Again, notice the name of the lighthouse on it. And this, and of course, those of you that have been on, uh, especially all the international tours, you know Handsome Phil over here, who is the one that uh, is in charge of all these photographs. And we always appreciate the work he does. So. Uh, on that same day, uh, we went down the road, not very far, to a lighthouse uh, called Trésion, which, uh, interestingly enough, if you see how this one's painted, uh, it's only painted on one side. I guess this is the way they say paint, because uh, this is probably the side that's uh, exposed to the sea, uh, and no reason to paint this side, because you didn't have to worry about being able to see it from this side. Again, notice all the hydrangeas along the way. And one of the other things uh, that they told us here, we don't know if this story is true or not, but at the entrance to this, they were saying that there, this place was bombed, you know, a bit during World War II, and, but the tower was damaged a little bit, but they found two unexploded bombs and took them apart and used these shells now as the entrance way to the lighthouse, just to remind them of, uh, of the uh, bombings that did take place there. And of course, as you see, you're coming out of the lighthouse and it's right red return. So they had that down, right? Uh, the day we were there, we noticed the day we were there was two days before this. And if we'd been there on this particular day, we could have gone up to the top of this lighthouse, 121 feet, and repelled down the side. And uh, of course, Marge Zop wanted to do it, but uh, we told her we were not going to be coming back just so she could repel. We thought this was a pretty cool idea. I'm not sure we had anybody that was capable of doing that, but uh, oh, I can wait a second. Before I get to this, that that night we went to Brest. It was a night where we had dinner on our own. And of course, what do you do when you have dinner on your own in France? You go to an Italian restaurant. And when it was all over, the ladies did their best imitation of a, of a French chorus line. And they didn't do too bad. You know, I didn't think. And then, of course, the guys tried it. And, of course, we looked like hell. I just, oh, there's Carl. Carl was, all kind of Carl was being held up by, by Dick. And, and it, <laughs> these guys were holding me up. And uh, it was just hilarious. And it gives you an idea. We really had some good times on this trip. And this was outside our, our French restaurant. Stan Meyer, if it hadn't been for him, I'd have totally fallen down there kind of thing. Um, from Brest, we went to uh, Ile de Bax, which again is another island. Uh, this was the only time that we actually chartered a boat. All the other ones were scheduled ferries. Uh, this one worked out pretty well. It only took us out there, and we actually took a, a ferry back. On the way out, uh, we passed a number of lighthouses. 
this was an interesting structure. It was called the uh, Castle of the Bull, which actually was built uh, in the 1500s as a fort, which actually uh, uh, in the, during World War II, the Germans took it over and put an anti-aircraft gun on it. And today it's just a tourist attraction, but um, it made for kind of an interesting structure on the way out to the island. Here we are at Il de Bats. Um, again, beautiful harbor, really nice coming into the harbor. I mean, this was from the boat as we came in. Um, the building itself, if you remember back to the building at Penn Mar, uh, this is supposedly a, a sibling of it. So if you look back at this one, these two were designed the same. Uh, and this one without the lantern, but with the lantern, that's what it would have looked like. Now, this was an interesting trip because we all, not everybody rode bikes because uh, either some people decided they didn't want to ride bikes or they wanted to walk. And it was, I don't know, it was a good two miles at least to the lighthouse. But we got bikes for everybody. The only smart one was John DeWire. He got a lady's bike. You know, the bike I got was a men's bike. By the time they put the seat up on it, I couldn't even hardly climb up on it. But once I climbed up on it, I was, you know, just, you know, had to balance myself, damn near killed myself. And it really, I think I should have walked. But this is the first time on any of the tours I've been on where we, we you know, we got bikes for everybody. And of course, going uphill, it wasn't much fun. Coming back, it was even more hairy because you were coming flying down these you know, these brick roads and everything. And, uh, but we all did survive. When we came back, this was where they dropped us off on the way back. And again, look at the, you know, where the, the road goes into the water. And this extent, it kept going way on down, down here. Gives you again an idea of how you had to be careful of when you scheduled your rides on the ferry to make sure that, you know, you, the ferry could dock where you wanted to get off of it. Okay, yeah, I need a drink of water, excuse me. Okay, the next day was one of the major highlights and one of the reasons I know some people went on this trip is we went to uh, Il Vieres, which is the tallest traditional lighthouse in the world. Uh, Again, I would note that one of the beautiful things about this trip is we spent five nights in the city of Brest just moving out to these various islands. And those of you who have ever been on one of our tours, five nights in the same location is just, you know, it's a godsend. Anyway, this happened while we were waiting to get the ferry. Uh, this is John DeWire here. Um, and I took this picture not knowing what was going on. Marietta here evidently asked Tom for some assistance to get up on this tractor. Not exactly sure why she was going to steal it or something. So eventually she got up on it and it was because she wanted to get a photo of this wonderful lighthouse. So all that effort to get this photo of this, and I, you know, Jeremy and I wouldn't call this a proper lighthouse, but evidently Marietta thought so. But, you know, we teased John a lot about that photo. I don't know if he's in the room today, but uh, if he isn't, you can remind him of that one. On the way out to um, this lighthouse, we passed, this actually was not on the way out. This was on the way back in, and those on the tour remember when we went out, we could barely see this lighthouse, and we couldn't see this one at all because of the fog, and we were really bummed out because, oh my God, by the time we get there, we won't even be able to see the tallest lighthouse in the world, but when we got there, we were able to see this lighthouse, which is the original lighthouse that was built there, which in itself is a pretty good sized lighthouse. It was a uh, hundred feet tall, built in 1845, but then they built this one. And this is 271 feet tall. It had 378 steps. And you know, the perspective of the old one versus the new one kind of gives you an idea of the tremendous difference. Now, this island is only about, 
like an acre and a half. It's, it's they're not very big at all. And we were there, if you look at where the water line is, we were there when the tide was pretty high. And so to give you an idea of the difference between this lighthouse, tallest one in the United States, of course, is at Cape Hatteras. That's 210 feet. So this is a full 61 feet taller and at least 100 and more than 100 more steps to the top. Now, when we landed here, this is all there is to the landing point for uh, Jovieres. So what you had to do was make sure that you, there was a very small window. And there was two boats. That, I think it was only like two times you could go to this island on a given day. And when we got there, the day before, we'd all talked about, OK, we're going to go up in two shifts. You go in group one. You go in group two. You know, take all the time you want, you know, because, you know, it's, it's you know, we don't want anybody dying on the way with climbing 378 steps. And so we said, no big deal. When they let us off the boat, they said, you've got 45 minutes for all of you to get out, to get to the lighthouse, go to the top, come back down. I said, 45 minutes? Yeah, we'd spend 45 minutes taking pictures out front. And then, so, and so, so we started buffing it. Said to hell with the groups, everybody just go. And so everybody started climbing and this was us on the way up. Now, this 300 over here was something, was an example of what they had. I think it was like every 50 steps, you would see one of these. And of course you're climbing and you think you're about ready to die and it says like 250. And then you keep going and then all of a sudden you're only at 300. And you know it's gonna be at least 350. But this was more discouraging than helpful. And, uh, and of course you could look up, but it, you know, it's very difficult to figure out exactly how far is that. And then when you finally made it to the top, here's Marge dragging herself up those last four steps, you know, puffing and puffing. We were all up there sucking oxygen by the time we got up there. I mean, really 45 minutes to get up, get your photos from the top and get back down really was, was a challenge. But everybody that went up, got back down, nobody missed the boat, and uh, we all got back safely. Of course, we all needed oxygen when we got back on the boat, but other than that, we were in pretty good shape. Okay, now, this, this day here is one of those days that Wikis dream about. It was a boat ride to a beautiful island. On the way, you saw eight lighthouses, on the island, you got to see one of the most powerful lighthouses in the world. You got to see the lighthouse that Jeremy showed us in his background uh, of the keeper with the wave going over the top. Uh, we, you get to see the first first order rotating lens that was in the Cordion lighthouse. Uh, I mean, the, 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 we all died and went to heaven on this day. And so on the way out from Brest, these were the first two lighthouses that we passed that were on uh, military bases. There we went by St. Matthew again. These, this was on the way out to the island. You know, some days people think, God, if we see two or three, it's great. This was just on the way. And I know there were more than this, and people with long range uh, uh, cameras were able to even see more lighthouses than this. And so this little circle right in here, you know, where I've only got, there's only five numbers. Well, Mary told me when she made the map, she just couldn't fit all those numbers in here. But this is the area where we saw all these lighthouses on the way out here. We stopped at this little island right here, which was on the way and loaded up more people. Boy, the ferry was really crowded on this particular day. And this is the, the, uh, the Isle of, of Wissant. And when we got to, this is the island out here. These are the three major lights out there. But when we got there, the first place they took us wasn't even on our list. And it was this one, which is the Nividic Lighthouse, which is uh, the interesting thing about this one, we thought, was when you looked at it here, here was the lighthouse here. here it had these towers over here. Now, I've never seen one where they built towers for a cable car to take the keepers in and out from this lighthouse. Now, there may have been another one out here, but evidently the Germans used this one a lot 
uh, during the war, and they and they had the cables strung here, and that's how. And eventually, you know, it was all, also we got electricity out there. But you know, we've all seen that little thing, that little cable car at the at the Noble. You know, this kind of remind me of that of you know putting somebody in this and then hauling them out to the lighthouse. So this was a, a nice bonus because we you know we didn't even know we were going to see it. Now you talk about some interesting rock formations. There was a couple more that we saw on on this particular island. This was the Crayon Lighthouse. Um, unfortunately, this particular one was not open for climbing. Um, again, this one uh, very similar to some of the other ones with the black and white markings. Uh, this one had some screening around the top. We were told uh, that they had a lot of problems with migratory birds, you know, crashing into the lantern room. Uh, I'm not sure they wouldn't fit through some of these, but I'm sure it helped uh, from keeping the, uh, the lantern room glass from uh, getting smashed. Behind this lighthouse, which again you can see right here, was the Museum of Light, 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 Lighthouses and Beacons. And this was like walking into the, what is it, the main Maritime Museum uh, where the, all them Fresnel lenses are. It had all these Fresnel lenses, but then a lot of information about reflectors, um, you know, lighting apparatus. Uh, I mean, and, and again, one of these places where I could show you 30 photographs of all the different stuff, but very, very interesting. And then, of course, this was one that uh, very few people get to see. This is the first order lens, the first rotating Fresnel lens that was ever put in a lighthouse. Uh, and this was, let's see, this was back in 18, I got it written down here, I had to write it down, 1823, uh, this lens was put into this lighthouse at Cordillon, uh, which is the oldest lighthouse in France, built back in 1611. We did not see this one, but we saw the lens which had been removed from that particular tower. Very cool, very different uh, than anything that I had ever seen before. I'm, I'm not used to seeing them with these reflectors, you know, on top. Uh, the other lighthouse on the on the island uh, was the Lustif lighthouse. Interesting because of the double tower. There was actually they actually had keepers' houses, but they actually had some keepers' quarters in this uh, tower right here. This tower was basically hollow, and this is where the stairs were walking up here, and they would have oh uh, like a small room with beds and things like that. So I guess the keepers could, you know, the ones that were on duty could stay there, but they did have the keepers' houses. Um, there's actually two galleries up here. There was one here and then one above it. Um, this one is one of the few in the world that had an elevator. And, you know, I know some of you have been to Sullivan's Island and there are others in Europe that have elevators. But again, um, this one, can't remember, I don't have written down here what year this was built, but obviously it had to have been built, uh, you know, more recently since how it had an elevator in it. Then we, then we went here. And as Jeremy pointed out, uh, this particular photo uh, taken by John G. G. Shar from a helicopter um, when he was waiting for, a, you know, he waited for a storm hired a helicopter, went out here uh, to, to photograph the lighthouse during that storm. And the reason the keeper came out was because he heard the light, uh, the helicopter, and he didn't know what that was. So he came out to look, and that's just when he caught this particular photo um, of the wave coming over, you know, the lighthouse. And this particular area, again, is an area of very, uh, strong waves as you saw back there but here this is not this is just a photo i took off the internet to give you an idea of sometimes of you know what can actually happen here and of course we were all very excited i remember uh wanda mayo asking me you know are you guys are going to go to Le Wong, aren't we and i said oh yeah we're going to go there and we're going to see these huge waves crashing around it and everything and we got there and this is what we saw i mean it was like oh my god you know what the heck you know, th 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 what's the big deal, you know? And 
and if I think while we were there, because we actually saw this in two different directions, you know, there were some there were some boats, little little you know ribs out here doing little tours around the thing, which obviously would not be something you could normally do. Um, one of the stories they told us about this was that, uh, you know, then when it was first built, it wasn't really very stable and uh, was not uh, a particularly, uh, uh, you know, the, the keepers were not particularly fond of it because the place shook and trembled during storms. And then, but it wasn't until the 1940s they actually stabilized it. But, you know, I can't say it was a disappointment because it certainly gave us a, a pretty nice day to take photos and everything. And everybody's got that other, you know, poster anyway. Okay, we finally left the area of, of Brest and on the way to Saint Malu, where we stopped at Cape Friel, which uh, was a very interesting lighthouse, which this particular lighthouse wasn't built until 1950. Now that doesn't look like a lighthouse that was built in 1950. The original lighthouse is over here, which was built back in the 1700s. But when they, again, when they were updating and upgrading, uh, they decided to build this one to replace this one over here. And right now, this is one of the most powerful lighthouses um, in France. It, uh, it also draws some like, something like one and a half million tourists a year, most of which were there on the day we were there. I had to do a lot of Photoshopping to get all those people out of here because it was almost impossible with the, with the crowds. Uh, and if Phil Borkowski is listening, I waited patiently till everybody left, but they never left. So um, again, they claim this thing, this lighthouse has a 61 mile range, which I kind of doubt. I don't think you can really see anything that far simply because of the curvature of the earth. Had a very interesting uh, keeper's quarters down here in this U-shaped building. Here's the, uh, the, the lantern room. And you know, it's interesting that they built all this up here on a stone with this castulated look, um, even in 1950 to give it that, you know, that kind of ancient look. Uh, very cool lighthouse at this point. Um, this is the one that was built in the 1700s. Kind of looks familiar. There's one of them double towers again. If we go back to uh, La Stiche, this was actually, this one was kind of modeled after this one, which is why, you know, the end, it looked like the one we saw just the previous day. From there, and this is, uh, th I did not take this photo. I don't have a, a drone or anything. This is a picture of a postcard we took uh, when we went to the city of San Malu. Uh, this is a great photo because it shows you this is actually an island with a walled city uh, with the walls and big sea walls all around it, which was um, really a, uh, a major strategic uh, location uh, at the entrance to the uh, Rayon River, which is uh, a major river that actually has one of the few tidal uh, power plants in the world. And this particular fortress uh, was guarding that entrance. You can see another fort that was built out here uh, defending this particular city. While we were there, we did get a chance to go in the city, uh, very narrow streets, uh, as you can see by this particular picture. And then a lot of us did a pretty good long walk around this seawall around here. This picture was taken when we left the city, but here's that seawall going around it. Uh, we really didn't have a lot of time to spend here because we started in Brest that day, had to go to Cap Friel and catch the ferry to, uh, to Jersey from here, which was of course our next stop. Again, here, another photo of that seawall surrounding the city. Uh, before we go to Jersey, let me go real quick, take a look at some of the food that we had while we were uh, in France. Um, in Brittany, what we used to call a crepe is called a galette. And it's the same thing as a crepe, except it's made with buckwheat pancake. Uh, I got to the point I was eating a lot of these because I couldn't pronounce anything else. And, the, uh, and you'll notice here, 
they have galettes and crepes. And the crepes are made with wheat flour pancake. And the, the main dish here with the ham and the egg and all that uh, was a galette. But then when they put, you know, like chocolate or something like that in it, they put it in the more traditional crepe of a wheat flour pancake. Now, one of the things we found out when we had meals was there was always an entree. Now, an entree isn't what I thought. I always thought an entree was the main course. In France, it means it's the entrance into the main course, hence the name entree. And these are just some of the things we had. This is a toasted bread with goat cheese and apples. This is four kinds of tomatoes. I wasn't sure these were good, but I, you know, they, I wasn't sure about some of the colors. This was one of the ones that just had a three salami salad. And this one was called a Breton salad. Hell, that was a whole meal in itself when you come right down to it. And some of the other ones we had were like that also. Now you always hear about the desserts. And we did have some very interesting desserts. Uh, this was a pavlova, uh, you know, with the meringue in it. I uh, can't remember what, I, let's see, I wrote this one down. A tart, a tart ton, which is, uh, it's made of a pastry and a, well, you've got sugar, it's all caramelized and it's got fruit on the bottom. And it's very good. This was my favorite. This is called a Paris breast which uh, is made of a, of a pastry with a, a praline flavored uh, cream inside. And this of course is the, the good old chocolate eclair with a pistachio cream on top. Uh, the, you know, the main courses were, I thought the entrees and the desserts were better than the main courses. Remember that Italian restaurant I told you we went to in Brest and did the, the line dancing afterward? This was my pizza. This is a, a French pizza. This was a three salami French pizza. Um, and, and being Breton, of course, a lot of influence from, from England. So things like uh, uh, Guinness uh, and Guinness stew and things that, like that were common. Oh yeah, we saw a lot of risotto. Anybody on this tour was, you know, there was shrimp risotto and then there was seafood risotto. This was not good for those people that uh, were allergic to shellfish. And to be honest with you, I was done with risotto by the time we got done. This over here one night was uh, pork cheeks, not something I'd eaten before. A lot of laughter about which part of the, which pork cheek is actually this part of it. Which cheek is that of the, of the pig? So give you some idea of the things we had to eat there. Then we made, then we went to Jersey. Uh, this ferry was a little bit larger, as you can tell down here. Remember I said we didn't have enough time to see a lot in Saint Malo, but uh, actually we did. This ferry was delayed a significant amount of time. Uh, this was our activity while we were waiting. Just, and you know, never seen a place that had no, you know, more, more than, you know, this place had like three chairs, but then I guess, I, you know, most people don't end up waiting, I don't know, several hours uh, to, you know, before the ferry actually got there. And actually, once you get on this, these ferries, the one went to Jersey and from Jersey to Guernsey and back to uh, the mainland, were pretty comfortable. We had all these nice reserved seats. They had bars and restaurants and uh, um, what do you call them? What do you call the places where you get all the, you know, the low price stuff? Uh, well, you know what I mean. Gift, you know, not a gift shop. But, oh, duty free. Sorry, duty free gift shops. And. Uh, and so finally, we uh, on the way away from Semelo, we did run into another lighthouse, and we also got an opportunity to see a range light in action. We, you know, if you manage to get this right when the uh, boat was in the right location, you can see the two lights on the one at the harbor and the rear range light back here. So the Channel Islands. This the, the Channel Islands actually belong. It, well, they don't really belong, but there are two areas of the Channel Islands that are called Bailiwicks. The Bailiwick of Guernsey, the Bailiwick of Jersey. They're actually referred to as British Crown Dependencies. There's only three British Crown, Crown Dependencies. These two and the Isle of Man, which of course is off the, uh, the coast of, of Wales. Uh, they're basically independent for everything except uh, for national defense and foreign affairs. So they, 
they have their own legislatures, they have their own currencies, uh, they have their uh, everything you know is uh, is localized, and they are very much independent of each other. And over here on the right, you can see you know the Jer what was the Jersey pound, and on the bottom the Guernsey pound. The only problem with this this uh, money was that if you gave them pound, British pounds, or you gave them euros, which we were spending in France, they always gave you change in the Jersey pound or the Guernsey pound, which wasn't any good anywhere else. So in effect, any change you got, you had to get rid of before you left that island or went back to the mainland. I think that's kind of the way it was in uh, uh, the Isle of Man also. The three islands we visited here, one was Jersey, one was Guernsey, and the third one was Sark. They even had their own cows. Of course, these are the Guernsey cows, and these are the Jersey cows. And as anybody can tell you that was there, we went all over the island of Jersey. They said there were like a thousand Jersey cows. I think we saw two, and that's it. So we didn't see any big herds of Jersey cows. We did get some Jersey ice cream, which is much higher in butter fat uh, and really, really good stuff. Of course, this is what the first thing I found when I got to the hotel in Jersey. The Savoy Hotel where we stayed, I called it the mothership of gin. Those of you who don't know me, I enjoy a martini once in a while. This place had 142 varieties of gin. Now, I got so confused about what to try, I had a beer. And so I never really even got around to getting into all these. So if you ever get to the Savoy in Jersey and you're a drink, drink, drink a gin drinker, you can spend some time there, that's for sure. Jersey and Guernsey, I was not really aware of this until I studied up a little before we went. They were the only two British territories that were occupied uh, during World War II. And these two islands were occupied in a big way. Uh, before the Germans occupied them in 1940, a full one third of the people on these both these islands, about 30,000 residents, all bailed out and went to uh, and went to England. But that left an awful lot of people on the islands that were subjected to be almost being slaves during the German occupation. And there was a lot of things in remembrance there: rangefinders, fortifications, underground tunnels anti-aircraft guns, all these things that were reminders of the times that the Germans uh, were there. Uh, a museum we went to had a really interesting set of displays of tapestries that were, uh, this is only one of them, but they were all depicting that German occupation, which was very, very hard on these people. And of course, then we were able to see what they call Celebration Square, which was a statue to the day the island was, was liberated from the Germans. Now, Channel Islands didn't have a lot of lighthouses and some of them were not proper lighthouses, but this next one that uh, we saw uh, at La Corbiere was really worth it. Um, this was the first concrete lighthouse in the world. Uh, it's situated on an island. It's actually a tidal island, so when the tide is in, uh, you, can, you can't walk to it. When the tide is out, you can walk to it. Uh, it's accessible by this causeway going out here. Now, when you get out here, the, the steps that we counted for this one were just getting up to the lighthouse. Uh, we were not able to get inside this lighthouse. They were having some kind of renovations done. The uh, woman that gave us the, uh, the tour uh, out there, you know, had thought she might be able to get us the keys, but we were not able to get into it. Um, okay, here's, here it is from a little further back. Again, you can kind of see that there's not a lot of, you know, area going across here, but as the tide comes in, it starts to look more like this. This is kind of when you start running, you know, and then when you hear the, this noise of this, this siren going off pretty much means you, know, you better be over here and not back here. Uh, there was a lot of uh, you know talk about, actually we didn't have a problem because 
this all happened after we were out there, came back and ate at a restaurant, which actually overlooked this particular uh, causeway. And we were able to watch the tide actually come in. Um, this was very unusual in terms of the lighthouses we saw in France, simply because it's one of these ones built on the top of a rock. Here's the same lighthouse, but again from the water as we took the ferry from uh, Jersey to Guernsey. Now when we got to Guernsey, um, again, we didn't see very many cows. If you ever get a chance, read this book. It's called the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. And it's a, if you haven't read it, it's a series of letters that were supposedly written back and forth between people in London and on Guernsey during the occupation of uh, World War II. And it gives you a really pretty good idea of what went on, why things were so hard on people, all the, uh, all the uh, curfews that were in effect, the rationing of food. So, it, you know, I, found, I read it after I was there, which uh, actually made it even kind of more interesting because of all we saw while we were there. The next day, we left uh, Guernsey and went to the island of Sark uh, on another ferry, um, which is a small island off, you know, the, and again, part of what was called the Guernsey Bailiwick. Uh, when we got there, it was a pretty good uphill climb to where you started to walk to the lighthouse. <laughs> this is what they call a toaster wagon. And the reason it's a, called a toaster wagon, it's got these slots in it, and you just, they just cram people in these slots. And I mean cram. And if you can see how much down here, how much knee room there is between this seat and this seat, I mean, there's like none. Now, you had to be pretty familiar with the person sitting next to you and across from you. Uh, and a number of our folks decided they did not want to ride in the toaster wagon, so they walked. But this was an experience and uh, pretty uncomfortable, very dusty, but it really, I thought it'd be walking. When we, oh, um, one of the things about the island of Sark, uh, there, are, there are no vehicles except tractors and the num amount of lighting at night is very, very low. This, is the, this was the first island dark sky location in the world, um, which basically means that uh, you can see stars and do your astronomy with the naked eye. There's no light pollution. Uh, and this being what they referred to as a dark sky island. Um, when we got up in the toaster wagon, this was the other way you got around on the island. Uh, I got a picture of this right here. This is the ambulance. <laughs> so, you know, if you were, if you needed the ambulance, they had to go hook up the tractor here and then drag the ambulance. I don't, it really wasn't that big an island, but I guess, you know, there might have been a time when uh, you had to be hauled to uh, some kind of a hospital facility, but uh, I got a kick out of that being the ambulance. On the way into the island, this was the what's referred to as the Sark Lighthouse or the Point Robert Lighthouse. Um, it's a relatively short lighthouse, only like 55 feet tall, but it's got a pretty high focal plane, if you can imagine. It's over 200 feet up here in the air. And as we were coming in, we were looking, oh crap, you know, well, it looks like you go in from up here, and you have to walk down to it, which is where we also looked from down here and saw that short lighthouse the, uh, the lighthouse only had 51 and a half steps, but from up here, it was 145 steps to go down to the lighthouse, which is, it's always funny to tell people, well, it's 150 steps to get down to the lighthouse. Most people think it's up to the lighthouse. 145 down, 59 and a half to get up, 59 and a half to get down, 145 back up. I tell you, we were, we were pretty much beat by the time we walked to this lighthouse, which was at least over, over a mile, and then did all this. But it was it was worth it. Uh, very interesting. The keeper, who actually still is the keeper there, uh, met us and went in with us. Interesting enough, this is actually designated as one of the rock lighthouses for Europe, uh, or for, for England, 
which means the keepers get better pay because normally they were stuck out on these rocks. This was pretty good duty because as the guy said, he says, I can go, you know, at the end of my day or at the beginning of my day, I can go to the pub and then walk back to the lighthouse, which is totally different than most rock lighthouse keepers. And then on our last day on the island, we ended up being able to go to Lay and Law Lighthouse. Um, this one required a ride on a rib. Uh, again, we prayed for good weather and we got it. And we had to all suit up here. Here was group number one with all their light gear on and there's Phil with his camera in a bag, always carrying a bag like he should. The second group, this is what it looked like on the rib to get out there. And once you got out there, this is what you saw. This again, uh, this is one of, again, one of the rock uh, lighthouses built on the rock. Uh, the, uh, this particular one you was built, was, was designed by the same, by Douglas, who was the same guy who designed, designed the current uh, lighthouse at the Eddystone. Those of you that were on that trip to the Eddystone, this should look fairly familiar, but it had vertical and horizontal uh, interlocking blocks, which make it you know, virtually indestructible in terms of not being knocked over. Of course, it has that thing we none of us really like because it kind of takes away from the you know, traditional lantern room, uh, the helicopter pad uh, on the top. And this is us when we left that particular lighthouse. Uh, David, our guide back here, uh, we, we ended up being able to take him along, which we was, was very grateful for. Uh, of course, these two in the front are asked, kept asking for the guy to cut more donuts, you know, and get us wetter. But fortunately, it wasn't wet enough. It wasn't rough enough for it to be a problem. Okay, so in, in summary, we took 12 coaches for over 1,000 miles. We were on 11 ferries and boat charters, went 344 miles on those. This I couldn't calculate. I have no idea how much time we spent waiting for ferries. And the thing was is we never wanted to miss one. So we, and we never wanted, we always wanted to get the best seats or wanted to have the best vantage points to take pictures. So we're always down there an hour and a half early. And then when they're delayed, we're in there longer. But we spent a lot of time waiting for ferries. My GPS told me I walked 83 miles. Of course, we rode in the toaster wagon. We rode those bikes and we rode on a rib. Now, if you added things up, we climbed 2,488 and one half steps. Now, these numbers right here came from Tom Chisholm. Now, if, if you're familiar with when you go and look at things like uh, Lighthouse Directory, um, any other sites that tell you how many steps are in a lighthouse, you get all kinds of answers. But if you want the true number of steps, you ask Tom Chisholm. And so at the end of every tour, Tom makes his report and those, you know, about how many steps. And of course, to us, this is the Bible, all right? And, and those numbers on miles that we drove and everything, those come from Darlene. And those are about as accurate as you can get. She drives drivers nuts marking down every mile that we move on a coach. Here's that list um, The in this particular list to give you an idea of the heights of some of these lighthouses. But <coughs> these are the steps and this is the information that was provided by Tom. Anybody who would like me to send this to him, let me know. It's, uh, it's readily available. I wanted to point out a few cute pictures I got. One of the things that happens on these tours is you gain weight. This is a picture of Bill Wayne Scott. And when he went to get on a ferry, they put this on him instead of on his bag. This is Stan Meyer and I having some fun at the uh, at a museum uh, that had some of those mirrors, you know, the you know, house of mirrors kind of thing. This is Brian Elliott, who wasn't real fond of climbing lighthouses, but he did. Uh, but when he got to the top, he stayed pretty close. Uh, Peggy Wayne Scott, who found one of the bigger, uh, she always collected rocks with hearts, and uh, Bill kept saying, that's too big, we can't take that back, that's too big. Uh, 
Here, of course, is Wanda. You know, we ate a lot of ice cream, and I got a good picture of her doing that. And then our guide, of course, you know, we just wore him out. You know, this is Dave again at the end of the day. I mean, I, I talk about somebody who worked hard, you know, talking in two languages and making sure that we all were able to find our way. This is us today. This is Team Sherwood 2.0. Uh, those of you that know us uh, can vouch for the fact that we've lost a few pounds in here. Since uh, January, I've lost 250. Mary's lost 23. So we've lost a, I've lost 50, not 250, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so anyway, 50 pounds less. So as you can see, I'm ready to go again. So thanks for your attention. Uh, Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Jeremy will now answer any questions, since I'm sure I about wore out. Thank you, Skip. Oh. Wow. <laughs> and I was going to say, I don't think there'd be a whole lot left if you lost 250 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm grateful that you only lost 50 pounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, I was trying to figure out that 2,488 and one half step. And I saw you'll that. Have this... to ask, you'll have to ask Tom Chisholm where that came from. Okay. Where's that? That was, in, that was in the lat, that was on that lighthouse at Sark. Yeah. He put that half step in. So yeah, he must have gone down and stumbled on something <laughs> and said that was a half step. You know? Okay. Okay. Well, maybe uh, Darlene and Tom can explain that to us. But, um, Anyway, so uh, we can open it up to, to questions now. So those of you who are Zoom pros know about the, the raise hand feature. Uh, for those of you who don't know, if you click on participants, if you're on a desktop computer, and I think laptop computers work the same way, if you click on, and Jeff, help me if I'm, if I'm saying something wrong, but click on participants, and you should see over in a, like a, on the right somewhere, you should see raise hand as an option. Uh, and if you click on that, we should see that you have your digital hand raised and that uh, will signify that you have a question for us and we can call on you and we'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can do so and then you can, ask, you can actually verbally ask your question. So I hope that makes sense. Did I explain that right, Jeff? You, you can unmute yourself, Jeff. You're still muted. Yes, you did uh, explain it. Okay. And you can also ask questions in the chat. So if you want to ask questions in the chat, you can do so, and Jeff or I will read the question to Skip. Uh, people are complimenting you, Skip, in the chat uh, from Marge uh, Zop. Great trip to memory land, Skip. She was on the tour, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Loved it. It was a wonderful trip. A uh, bunch of other uh, compliments. People enjoyed that. So does anybody, I don't see any hands raised. There's got to be some, you did such a thorough job, Skip. I don't know. Let, let, me, let me ask Claire. Hey, Claire, how'd I do? Where's Claire? Uh, Claire, raise your, can you raise your hand so we can see? There you are. That's yes. not Claire. That's a different. How'd I do, dear? Bonjour. That's a different. Oh, that's the, is that is that the same Claire? Or is that a different Claire? <laughs> no, this is this is the Claire that was the one that was able to help us a great deal with with the uh, French language. Uh, when we went out to dinner, at least we knew what we were ordering when she was with us. Okay, because I saw Claire's. Oh, that's Marge's up, right? I was mixing All up right. the two people. I'm sorry. Okay. Actually, you did a beautiful job, Skip. You really did. I think your French is also improved. Just for this presentation, I would give you uh, an A plus. I think. But but you know, I what I learned is don't don't try to pronounce it slowly. Don't yeah. go la many zier. Say say it fast, and and it sounds like you you know what you what you're talking about. No, great job. Absolutely Thanks. great. Thanks. Wonderful trip. Oh, I see a hand raised. Looks like Scott Scott Walbert. Uh, Scott, you can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Okay, we on? Yes. Hey, Skip, a question about the Tour de France. Did you run into any um, 
of the true. actual setup for it or, you know, as they were getting ready for that since you were ahead of it? No, actually, they were ahead of us. Oh, okay. It started out, uh, it started on the 7th and it started kind of south of uh, Brittany and went into Brittany around the 9th or 10th. And we didn't start, or actually our first night there in Nantes was on the 12th. So what we, what we saw was places that, you know, they had been and had probably over, been overrun, you know, afterward. Uh, actually, it was kind of a blessing at the beginning because it kept some of the tourism down. But as we went on, it was, uh, you know, there was a lot of people running around. I and mean, it's a very popular tourist uh, destination or vacation destination for the French and the, and the, and the English. But, you know, thank God we didn't run into any of that stuff. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. And this this tour skip crossed. Uh, you were in two different countries, right? Skip France and England. Well, yeah. If you, if you count the British Isles as uh, or as the Channel Islands are actually part of England. Mm -hmm. and then, you know, and we had, like I said, we had to we had to deal with three different currencies, and actually, some people are using British pounds in uh, in France, uh, but then those problems with the two you know the two islands having their own currencies. And there was, uh, there is one Channel Island that still belongs to France, which we actually included on a different tour prior to this one. Which huh. one is that? <laughs> uh, you know which one it is, right, Skip? <laughs> don't, don't look at me. <laughs> Are there any other what questions, Jeremy? Um, Linda and David Rosenblum has his hand up. You had such incredible weather. Were you just lucky? Yes. Uh, you know, when we saw those hydrangeas, we thought it was going to rain every day. Um, <laughs> trying to think, you know, it rained, it rained the last, you know, not the last, we actually stayed margin for two, you know, Amigos stayed the last day and it rained that day. And it rained one other day and it was foggy a couple of days, but it never, it never presented, prevented us from uh, getting on one of those, you know, boats. I, I thought sure that, you know, some ferry was going to get canceled and we'd lose out. Uh, that would, that's just, you know, that's just our dumb luck. And, uh, you know, that, of course, that always happens when we leave a tour. Um, <laughs> the tour we did with Bill and Judy Newbloom of the, uh, of all the reef lights in Florida. I mean, what are the chances you get to every one of those in a period of about five or six days? Yeah. And, and that was just because we were along. I mean, Judy and Bill led the tour, but we were along for the weather. <laughs> Thanks. Tough we, have a, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Sheila asks, Skip, did you see any amazing marine or avian wildlife? Skip, did you hear that? I can't remember. Uh, oh. Ask Ken Mulder, he's the, he's the birder. Uh, Ken, are you out there? Not sure if he's here. I thought I saw him. Yeah, I'm here. There he is. There he is. Well, I, we did not see anything uh, particularly exciting in the avian world, and uh, I don't recall in the marine uh, uh, animals either. So. Yeah, that's that. Usually, usually we see a lot of that, but then again, you know, there weren't any wetlands or. Uh, and we didn't see marine life either. I'm not sure why or why not. You know? Not even seals or uh, porpoises, things like that? No? No. Oh. Mm -hmm. Just lighthouses. Yeah, lots of lighthouses. There's a question over here, Jeremy, I see from Jeanette O'Neill says, what do we consider to be a proper lighthouse? Yeah, I saw that. I wasn't sure I wanted to tackle that. We could, <laughs> we could, we could, yeah, we could that's talk. That's one where a lighthouse is wearing a tie, right? Yeah, right. You know, I don't know. I, it, it's just, you know, yeah. there are a lot of, you know, we, we laugh about them, you know, things that look like water heaters with a light on them and, and lighthouses on sticks and some pier lights and uh, uh, things like that. We, we just, you know, it's just sort of like, you know, when you see it, you just sort of know that's a proper lighthouse. And uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Wayne Wheeler would have a, even a different uh, definition 
we should ask him some some time because I've heard him berate people about that's just not a lighthouse, you know. And so yeah. I'm sure he has a pretty good idea of uh, what it is. I think that the, the good definition would be uh, a lot of these smaller ones are navigational aids solely that didn't have a human element where a keeper or a family lived there. So when you're talking about proper lighthouses, proper probably isn't the right word, but it's uh, those properties that had a human element attached to them where you would have something else there besides the light, like a keeper's dwelling, you know, oil houses, a barn, boat houses, a, a light station, so to speak. That would be proper, I think. Okay, we'll go with that. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's it's hard. There's there's a lot of borderline cases. It's it's a, the, you know, and I try to stay out of those arguments because they go on forever. I see Tom Chisholm down here. Ask him about the half step. Let's see. Chisholm's right, Tom, one tell up. us about the half step. Where are the Chisholms? Yeah, you can un un unmute un un yourself. Got to unmute himself. Here he goes. There okay. you go. The half step was uh, going into the tower at Sark. There was just a small little ledge type thing there, and I couldn't count it as a full step, so I counted it as a half step. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll we'll accept that. French Channel Island, it's how to say C H A U S E Y. Claire, how do I pronounce it? She didn't hear it. Your sound is a little. My sound funny. is off. Your, so, yeah. your sound is okay, kind of coming and, coming and going, but they say that again, Darlene. It's Chausey, C-H-A-U-S-E-Y. Chausey. Chausey. Yeah. Good job. Good job, Darlene. Okay. And the other thing, I say Alberge, I don't know how the French pronounce it. But that lighthouse actually has 402 steps. We have a certificate from the first Brittany tour when we went all the way to the top. You'll remember they were working on some restoration work, so we couldn't get to the top. And it is totally awesome to get to the top because the first time I charged up, I got halfway up and I looked down and said, oh, look how far I've come. And then I looked up and went, oh my God. Look how far I have to go. <laughs> so awesome. So totally, it's awesome. pronounced um, La Vierge. La Vierge is the way you pronounce it. La Vierge. Oh, La Vierge, I'll never yes. remember that. I said La Vierge for so long, it's <laughs> ingrained. <laughs> Unforgettable. Unforgettable. Yeah. Let's see. I'm going to post something in the chat. I'm going to post a link. There's actually an animation that shows several. Uh, frames of that that famous photo by Jean Guichard of the La Jamont Lighthouse. Uh, mm -hmm. I just posted it. You can mm -hmm. find that link. And take hey, Jeremy, I'm going to unmute uh, Bill and Judy Nubel and they have a question. Okay, I just want to finish what I'm saying. Okay. Um, if you go to that link, you'll see an animation of several frames and it shows the wave wrapping around the lighthouse. You can actually oh, see the keeper the disappearing back into the lighthouse. So you might want to follow that link and take a look at that. It's kind of fun. So uh, go ahead. Uh, Judy, you have to un yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Hey. I just had a question about the uh, oldest lighthouse, and I don't speak French, Cord Cordillon or something like that. Cordillon. Yeah. Um, was that real far from you know the uh, lighthouses that you did tour, and that's why you didn't get to see it? I've been familiar with it on um, postage stamps, so I was kind of curious about it. What do you say, Jeff? Didn't you guys go to that, go to that one on another tour? Yeah, it's, it's out of the region that this tour was on. It wasn't part of it. The reason why Skip mentioned that particular one, which is it is a beautiful lighthouse. It's one of the most ornate lighthouses that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. but, um, it, it was special yeah. because that was the location yeah, of the first Fresnel lens that was uh, that Augustine Fresnel built and installed. So that's why they saw the lens, but not the lighthouse. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, lens. it was pretty, you know, it, it wasn't really within the realm of, we had to go way out of our way. Well, and the fact that the first lens that he ever built still survives is a miracle. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
I did. I did the history of Cardawen Lighthouse in one of the episodes of the podcast. It's, I'd love to see that. I haven't been there, but I'd love to see it. Uh, anybody else? Let's see. I'm looking to see uh, if there's any other questions in the chat. So well, one of the questions in the chat was, what is your favorite lighthouse and why? That's from Minnie Lee to everyone. <laughs> it would take a while to have everybody answer that question. Uh, and I, I've, I've, let's limit it to the lighthouses on, the, uh, in, on that particular tour. Skip, did you have a favorite lighthouse on the tour? Uh, probably the last one. <laughs> because it was because it was tour over. Was over. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the last one was you know the one at Leanwa was was fun because yeah. you know we went out on the rib and 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 seriously it was the last one and you know after being with this crowd for eighteen <laughs> days it was time to go home. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty famous. I love all you guys. You know that. <laughs> that's a pretty famous lighthouse. That's one of the great wave swept lighthouses. Like you were saying, the, the building of it is uh, it's considered a very important example of uh, a granite wave swept lighthouse. Ask, ask Marge what her favorite one was. Come on, Marge. You were there. Oh, there's Marge. Marge, you want to unmute yourself? Do you want to tell us what your favorite on the tour was? You really want me to unmute myself? There you go. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. We can mute you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. La Corbier, no question. Oh, from both, from both sides. The one on Jersey. Yeah. Um, it was interesting when I set this tour up, and I at one time I suggested to Jeff that because I looked at the Channel Islands and, and there was a lot of you know uh, issues of getting around and all that, and I said, well, why don't we just do Brittany and forget the Channel Islands? And he said, no, no, you got to go there. And it turned out that we had to go there because it, it was for Mary and Phil's you know, 50th wedding anniversary or something like that. And as it turned out, those three lighthouses at Sark in Jersey, La Corbier, and Lanois were really three of the coolest lighthouses we saw. So it was definitely worth going over there. Was that a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing any other questions. Last last call for questions. Both uh, if you want to raise your hand or ask in the chat. Oh, actually, okay, there is another question uh, from uh, DDA or D Diddy. I'm not sure how this person pronounces their name, but are you planning another trip to France? Uh, I'm not going to try the pronunciation, but in southwestern France has some great lighthouses. Uh, is are there any other trips being uh, considered in France, uh, Jeff? Not at the moment. That? Before before this one, we've done. We went to Normandy, and we've also done one to the south of France in Corsica. So uh, France will be a number of years before we go back to actual France, but we'll go back to Europe soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we're supposed to have a trip go to Sicily and uh, Malta and the and the uh, the uh, part of uh, Italy proper that was obviously postponed till next year. So we always hit Europe at least once a year. Yeah, hopefully tours will happen next year. 2021 for sure. Yeah, okay. So I'm not seeing any more questions. I think uh, probably uh, we can kind of wind things down. Skip, would you uh, like, do you have any parting, parting words for us, Skip? <laughs> Is it time for my farewell any, speech? Any, any words of wisdom? Is this a farewell dinner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, again, you know, I, this particular trip was just so much fun. Uh, I mean, it, it, I, I'd been to France about 40 years ago, you know, and, but I did all the touristy things then. And, and this was just a great chance to go to a part of France that, you know, again, not many people can see. Uh, well, they could if they wanted to, but it's not on most people's radar uh, because it, I mean, the main thing I think is the lighthouses in the islands. But everybody that was on that trip, I, I think, had a really good time. Uh, the, uh, I, you know, of course, I always enjoy these things, but I always sweat them, you know, at the beginning and during them when they're over, you know, and all during it, I say, I ain't ever doing this again. And then when it's over, let's go again, you know, kind of thing. So, but that was the last one we did. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I, now that I've lost that 255 pounds, you know, <laughs> it'll be 
it'll be easier to climb up these lighthouses. Yeah. You know? And See. Jeff wants me to do another one that we've done, like the one that we did with you, Jeremy, to Scotland and England or the Wales and Isle of Man. You know, down the road at one of these, I, I'd be glad to work on that too. So, but that's up to Jeff. You know, he may have had enough of me already. <laughs> But thanks again for joining us. It's good seeing some of you. We really need, now you guys can do this Zoom. Now we ought to really just get a bunch of people together that was on one of these trips. I don't care about talking about the trip, just finding out how you're doing. Not seeing you on tours has been the big bummer of our existence yeah. here, you know? So yeah. it was great. stay safe. Wear those, wear those masks. Oh. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> good, very good, Skip. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Skip and Mary Lee. Thank you for everything you do, and thank you for appearing and reappearing as a ghost in the background. <laughs> I'm his moral support. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're a lot more than that. So yeah. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, for everybody, for being here today. Uh, thank you for all your support, and uh, take care. Enjoy the rest of your weekends, and we'll be doing this again, I'm sure, in the not-too-distant future. Right, Jeff? Yep, in two weeks, we're going to offer a, a tour of the Baltic region of Europe. That'd be the next Sounds one. good. Yeah. So these are almost as good as the real thing. <laughs> so again, thank you all so much. We'll see you again. Take care. Bye. Bye.